developing person-centered plans. To start us out though today, we have Aquila Jordan, who many of you know, and uh, she is the director of uh, Home and Community-Based Services Waivers for the state of Kansas and we'll start us out with a bit of a presentation. I believe we also have passed out the information for sign-in, make sure that continues to move along. Someone yesterday collected that and put it in their packet and we lost it. So keep it moving along if you would. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back of the room? Because if you say you can't, I have seats and I'd love people to sit close to me. I will try to project. I spent 23 years on stage, so Hopefully I have enough experience to get it back to the back of the room. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Aquila Jordan. Most people know me as Q, so if that rings a bell, that's me. I am a Denver transplant via Texas, and I've been in Kansas for almost two years. I have a little brother. His name is Isaiah. He is, now he's 10. I really wish he'd not get any older. He has Down syndrome. An uncle who had a traumatic brain injury when he was one, who has a developmental disability, he is now 67. And a cousin who has Down syndrome who is 50, she's an avid swimmer and a jazz connoisseur. Her father is a famous jazz musician and she just moved from California to Vermont and she's adjusting to the cold. So, so some of you may have seen some of my pictures before, you may have heard my stories before. When he said a short presentation, we'll skip the 40 slides. I may or may not have had more than I needed, but I'll give you a quick overview of how we got here. Why are we talking about person-centered planning today, and what are we going to be talking about moving forward? You heard from Secretary Bruffett and um, Director Randall that there are changes that have come down last year from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, switch those, Medicare and Medicaid Services, and they created a, uh, updates to the regulation at 42, CFR 441.301. Don't worry about remembering those things. I'm sorry numbers stick in my head. I will be posting all of my presentations online, so if you have signed in and put your email address, you will get an email when all of those are posted, so don't worry about it. You don't have to take furious notes. However, you might want to catch something and, and remind me later or ask a question. Because of that citation, the changes to that rule, regulation, there were three big things that changed. The three biggest things were person-centered planning had some federal regulations put around it for 1915C waivers. There is a new settings rule for home and community-based settings that defines that setting based on its quality, not so much its quantity. And we have a conflict-free system that requires uh, limitations in the system that have to be broken down by the types of assessments being independent from service provision as well as case management and guardianship which we will talk about a little bit in a session I have later today at 11 o'clock. The basic application of this rule is to the 1915C, 1915I, and 1915K. The regulation only mentions those three. However, CMS came out last fall and said because it's at the discretion of the Secretary of Health and Human Services whether or not the rules that apply in 1915 C's will apply to 1115, they will apply to the 1115 and they have made the decision that any changes to the 1915 C with this new regulation applies to any state that also has an 1115 and operates similar programs. As a result, the, the final rule highlighted these changes and one of those being <coughs> defining the person-centered planning process and the requirements. In Kansas, fortunately <coughs> for our IDD system, we have a very similar person-centered planning process and regulations that are close to, not quite the same as, but close to the federal regulations. The biggest change that we have with the changes to the rules is that for person-centered planning, it applies to all programs. We have person-centered processes in Kansas on all of our programs. However, there is a written report that's required now for every program for person-centered planning. And that's something different and new for some of the programs. What does the new rule say in general? You can read that, I'm not gonna read it to you. But it's basically CMS wants to make sure that individuals are getting services in the most integrated setting. Verbally, told somebody how you really felt about them. <laughs> how are you doing, fine? Yeah, we know what fine means. However, we oftentimes, when an individual is disabled, forget that and kind of move through a process. We move through the steps. 
I'm supposed to do X, Y, and Z, and forget that we're not always listening to what they're saying or not saying. Nonverbals are the majority of our communication. However, we often only listen to what we've heard. And sometimes, not all of us do a great job of that. I, I can say I speak more than I probably listen. For a person-centered process, there are three main steps going through the process. The initial assessments, and there are multiple assessments that CMS expects to see. Needs assessments, a functional level of care to be eligible for the HCBS programs. Behavioral health assessments, if they have a diagnosis that needs a, um, a screening or an assessment. Physical health assessments, universal assessments, they're called many different things, but overall that is the first stage. It's assessing the individual and assessing their needs. And typically that can be a formal document that is used to identify uh, activities for daily living, instrumental activities for daily living, or other limitations an individual has. Most assessments look at what you can't do, right? You go to an assessment, you go to the doctor, and they're looking at how sick you are. You don't go to the doctor to say, can you tell me how healthy I am today? Usually you're going to the doctor and they're going to go through a checklist to ask you about your allergies and ask you about last time you fell or if you have pain in a certain area. When you're looking at assessments, CMS wants to make sure they're comprehensive and they identify the whole person. So your assessments can't only be based on, a plan can't be based only on one assessment. It can't only be based on one section or segment of that individual's life. It has to be holistic in nature, and so usually states have multiple assessments. The functional assessment being the requirement for CMS to even start the waiver. And then the development of an integrated service plan that includes assessments for all of the other domains of an individual's life. That includes health risk assessments, universal and needs assessments. The problem is sometimes, like we talked about earlier, we forget the person in the process. We're following a person-centered process. They're, in, they're there, their family members are invited, but who's leading the ship? Who's driving the car? For CMS, the person-centered process, as much as is possible, it has to be the person. As much as is possible, the supports need to be there to allow the person to drive as much of the planning process as possible. So when you're looking at the person-centered process, instead of focusing on the report, the document, the written piece that CMS wants us to provide, is are we looking at where do we, is the person want to go? Today, in a year, in five years, the life goal, the long-term strategy that the individual has regardless of their needs or their disability. How are they going to get there? What kind of supports do they need in order to make it there? What are the things that they're good at? What are they capable of doing? Oftentimes our assessments, since they are usually based on what you can't do, sometimes when we're developing the plan, we don't focus on, okay, what are they good at? The best de definition of strength I've ever heard is that strength is something that makes you stronger. And a weakness is something that makes you weaker. Have you ever been good at something that you absolutely hate? And then your boss tells you, great, you're so good at this and gives you more and you dread going to work every day? A strength is not what you're good at. A strength is the thing that makes you better, makes you feel better, makes you stronger. So when you're looking at an individual's strengths, don't just look at they are good at following directions. Well, I don't want anybody to write that in my plan. I could follow directions, I don't want to, right? Being good at following directions does not necessarily make it your strength. When you're looking at the person, what makes them stronger? What do they like? What do they like to do? What things that when they go out, just their face lights up, they can't wait to do it again. Strengths can also be defined as those things that the first time you've done it, you just want to do it again. Have you ever seen a person just latch onto something that you didn't think they'd like? The first time you're like, here's something to do, and all of a sudden, they just, they can't stop but learning about it, they want to do it more often, they want to keep doing more. That is a strength. That's the thing that creates life in you. A weakness you usually identify by the thing that after you're done, you just want to sleep. You don't want to think about it again. You finish that spreadsheet and all 30,000 pages, and yeah, it's perfect, but you hate it. Just because you can do a good job at it doesn't mean you, know, you really like to. So the difference between strengths and capabilities, you're capable of doing the spreadsheet. It is not something you'd do for a living if you had to. What is, someone, what is something that gets in the way? So the barriers, instead of looking at them as a weakness or what a person can't do, Look at it as a barrier. What's the thing that gets in the way from them getting what they want, 
getting to where they want to go, having the supports they need to have, doing the things that make them stronger, doing the things that they're already good at. And that will help drive your plan of, all right, I know I have to do the written piece, and I know I have to check all the boxes and make sure it matches the definition and regulations. But when we're looking at person-centered planning, what is it about the person that we're listening to that can help us get to where we want to go? So the initial stages, stages you're all familiar with, is that introduction, getting the team together, finding out who all the people are going to be on that team. Who does the person want? If you can't discern it because the person is not able to communicate or they need other individuals, it make sure as much as possible you include family. You include other individuals. There's a limitation to my presentation, something you won't hear me talk about because that's part of my conflict of interest discussion. And one of the things that the secretary brought up that's kind of up in the air with CMS is whether or not the provider can develop a person-centered plan, which is something that is expressly put in regulation for IDD and expressly prohibited by CMS. So for CMS's purposes, the provider participates, the provider cannot develop the plan. And the reason being is there's already an interest in the plan and interest in the services. And the idea is if the individual is telling you what they want, they need to be able to say, and I don't want what I have now. And that's CMS's perspective on it is, if I want to say, I don't want you as a provider, it's harder for me to say it if you're the person who's developing the plan that tells you how I'm going to get support, how I'm going to get services, and someone may feel like, not because it's happening or not because it's true, but they may feel like if I say I don't want you as my provider anymore, maybe nobody will come and help me. Maybe I won't get supports anymore. So I'm less likely to say, I don't want you to be my provider anymore. I want to do, I want to live on my own and have somebody come in. I want to move back with my family. I want to move out of mom and dad's house. It's hard to say that with mom and dad's in the room, right? Except for if you're my sister at 17, she was like, I graduated high school and gone. At 18 on her birthday, she was home. Um, so we all have those experiences in life where we think we know what we want. It would, Trying to find that balance between allowing a person to make decisions and mistakes. Anybody remember in 21? Anybody want to forget me in 21? You know, sometimes not the best decision is the best life lesson we ever had. And so finding that balance between letting individuals make mistakes, letting individuals, you know, participate and make decisions that I may not agree with, but is not necessarily a bad decision in the sense of it's not going to hurt them, maybe, drink too much, might hurt you. Um, but you know, letting people have that ability. So what CMS wants to see, and something that we have in Kansas that other states don't have as much of, is letting people drive as much as possible. Giving them the tools to be in the driver's seat and control their destiny. So one of the things you need to look at is what is important to them. So you're developing a plan. And we're gonna use a scenario, we're gonna stop here, and we're gonna walk through some scenarios. So think of these things. What's important to a person? So developing the plan, you've looked at what are their strengths, what are their capabilities, what is important to them, what do they want. So you look at the important to. What the person tells you, verbally, non-verbally, is the most important thing to that person. Have you ever had a conversation with someone who kept telling you something that you're like, why are you talking about this? It's not important. Is it important to them at the time they're talking about it? Is it important to me that my husband understands the dishes have to be done at the end of every day? In his mind, it's, ah, oh, morning time isn't gonna kill you. Like, just get up in the morning. But it's important to me, that's why I'm talking about it. So understanding that what they're saying they want is the most important thing to them. It's important, what is important to a person includes not only what they're saying, but how they're responding. So if you have an individual who's in services who always, always, has an incident or acts out when Johnny comes in the room, what are they telling you? They can't say anything, but if that's the only person they ever react to, they're trying to communicate to you. That I don't, for whatever reason, it may just be because I don't like the color of Johnny's hair. But I can't tell you in a calm way that I can't stand the fact that he dyes his hair purple. Because they can't communicate that, they may be telling you in a different way. That's the way a child, there are certain people a child likes. I have two nieces. They are twins and they are 16 months old and they're at that stage where they like who they like and they do not like who they do not like. And there's no rhyme or reason and it may change tomorrow, but at that moment, I go to pick them up, it's heaven. 
they're the greatest kids ever. My husband walks in the room and they fall out and they swear the world is coming to end. The next day, they won't come to me at all and he's their favorite person. When that person, what a what person says is different from what they do, rely on the behavior. Just stop for a second and think in your own life. Have you been in a conversation with you significant others? Because that's often where we say what we say, but not what we mean. I say I'm fine, but I don't speak to you for the rest of the night. Am I fine? I say, yeah, I want to. I'd love to go to the movies tonight. No problem. The whole time, I'm tapping my fingers, I'm on the phone. I've got this look on my face. Behavior typically. Not always, but typically, if what someone is saying does not match their behavior, oftentimes the behavior trumps. Because the behavior is that thing you can't help, right? That facial tick that you just, you keep trying and you practice and you can't help it. Have you ever laughed at a time when someone fell and you know you shouldn't? Like, you, it's just automatic. You're just watching and you're like, oh, <clears throat> your behavior told, <laughs> told on you. Even though you're, oh, are you okay? Inside you're like, oh, that was really funny. Your behavior told on you. So oftentimes look at that, especially when you have people who are nonverbal. Don't worry about this sheet, but think about it for right now. Is when you're developing, how many of you are targeted case managers in the room? And developing a plan, do you have a rubric or a system that you use that you can repeatedly go through with individuals to make sure you're identifying what they like, what they don't like, what they want? Or have you kind of gotten in a rut and said, oh, I know Johnny, when I go to Johnny, we take pretty much the same plan and we change some dates and it doesn't really change. And maybe you've gotten in a routine, not saying that it, you know, we've all done it. Let's just be honest, right? There's been times when you're like, I know nothing's changing. I've tried asking them 50 million times. And so you get kind of in a rut. So think of ways that you can kind of shake that back up, get people back engaged. Because the more engaged I am in my plan, the more likely I'm going to follow through on it the more likely. Have you ever helped someone plan for college? Have you ever planned college for them? And said, oh, here's all the schools. You've got to go here. They're like, uh-huh, yeah. And they fill out the application, kind of, sort of. And they turn it in because you begged them. And you gave them the money. And you gave them the envelope. And you put on the stamp. And you walked it to the mailbox for them. How excited were they when they actually got into that school? Or did they even tell you? Because it wasn't their thing. Versus you didn't even know they've applied to these schools and they come out and they're like, oh my gosh, look at this place. And all you did was talk to them about applying to college. And it, they went off and did it all themselves and they were more engaged in the process, more interested in the whole entire thing. So you'll have all of that to look at. But the other piece to look at is not only what's important to them, but then the next piece, the piece that's most important to what we do is what's important for them. Because sometimes we don't always want what's good for us, right? Like, what's important to me is being able to hang out with my friends, not have to pay any bills, and the lights should just stay on. If I didn't have to pay a bill, I'd be the happiest person. Okay, what's important for me <laughs> is to have a plan to pay my bills, even if I don't want to write that check, so that my lights stay on. So you find that balance between what's important to the person and what's important for the person. So, goals, when you create them, have to be personal. What makes a goal personal? Come on, guys. Okay. It's a personal goal. It, it can't be something generic, right? One day when I grow up, I want to live by myself. Is that a goal that we just kind of put out there? Because everybody at 18 at one point wants to live by myself. Don't ask my My sister swore she wanted to do that, and she's been home three times. She kind of likes living at home. There's no bills to pay, and she can go grocery shopping. She used to come home. Oh, my gosh, she used to drive us nuts. She'd come home. Act like she was coming to visit, grab a gro your grocery bag and start filling it. And next thing you know, where's the milk? Oh, I didn't have any. Oh, okay, well, grown people go get their own milk. I did, at mom's house. She was very adamant that she was shopping. So personal is, <laughs> anybody have a 21, 22 year old at that age where it's like, magically you wanna come home all of a sudden because, man, um, so my bills didn't get paid. My mom, not like that. She was like, sorry, you want to come home? Why? <laughs> You're 18. Don't you want to take care of yourself? My sister has mastered the art of coming home. So what makes something personal? It's important to the person. It's something that they want. 
it's something that they've expressed to you that is important to them, that they are things that make them happy, bring them joy, make them stronger, things that bring them enjoyment. What is not personal, what the person needs is not a personal goal. I need a place to live is not the goal, right? What would be the goal separate from the need? Throw something out there. Okay, give me an example. Okay, want cigarettes, right? If the goal says, I want to quit smoking, and that's not their goal, are they going to quit smoking? I mean, you could put it there every year. They really want to quit smoking. Is that their goal or what we know is, is good for them, right? This is the thing you're supposed to do because the smoking is leading to these other health issues. The doctor said you need to quit. We all know you should quit, but if it's not their goal, whether you're disabled or not, you cannot make a person who wants to smoke stop smoking because it's the right thing to do, right? It's not what's good for them, and it's not what we think is appropriate or we think is the best thing for some. That's not a personal goal. So when developing goals, and you're developing personal goals, understanding that it's not what you think they should do or what you think they should need, but if the goal is or if the need is, I need a place to live. Okay, let's take that need. What would be the personal goal that you could work through with an individual for their plan? Okay, so I want to live in an apartment. I want to live in Topeka. No, I want to live in Kansas City. Well, I kind of want to live in Wichita. Okay, so you came down to, so you want to live in a big city. You identify, what I'm saying is, I don't want to go live out in Hayes. Can I live someplace bigger? All right, so that might, we might get down to you can't live in Topeka because something, and maybe Kansas City is too far away for you to have supports, but we can maybe do Wichita. All right, what does that look like? So taking the need and finding the want. Now, do we always get what we want? And do we always like what we need? Is this always going to be a happy, perfect process where everyone goes, thank you for asking me all these wonderful questions about myself. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to get everything I want because I really want that Cadillac and I really want the million dollars in the bank and I really want a bigger house and I really want my dog to be obedient and I really want the cat to stop running away. Okay, those are all nice things. What I need, what I want, and where I want to go to. So thinking long term, I want to get to the bigger house. Well, here's the steps and helping people get there. What makes it a goal? So first, we talked about what makes it personal. So what makes it a goal? Identifying the steps and what goals. Okay, having a definite end, right? So goals can't be, if you're six, the goal cannot be, I wanna live in my own home when I turn 18. Because at six, you have no concept of how to work towards living on my own at 18. At, at six, 18 is ancient. I mean, remember when you were 10 and you were like, you're 20? <gasps> oh, do you have gray hair? I mean, you just thought everyone was old. You I mean, couldn't imagine someone being 40. That just, oh, it blew your mind. So you can't think that far in advance. So looking at the age, the needs, the ability of that individual, the goal needs to be something that can be accomplished in a short period of time. And I did it again. Apparently, this is why I have to check on myself. Nope. So I need someone to be my spotter and say, you did it again, because I'll keep doing it. All right. The goal needs to be something that what we often call short-term versus long-term goals. When you're developing that plan, the plans are for a year. So think of what can be accomplished in a year, because we want wins. I want to get to the end of the year and say, I accomplished something. Have you ever, for your own life, made a financial goal? And you say, I want to go to Tahiti. And you know it's going to take you $10,000 to go to Tahiti, and you know you can't save more than $1,000 in a year. How long do you keep thinking about going to Tahiti before you give up on that and say, I want my $1,000, and I'm going to go buy something because I need something right now to make me feel like I've accomplished my goal? Take that same concept and say, okay, if, I, if I'm not going to sit around and wait and save $10,000, unless Tahiti is that important to you, which I keep trying to tell my husband it is that important to me. It is just not going to happen. Because <laughs> we get to the $1,000 and he's like, so I was thinking we should go do this. Because he is an immediate gratification person as it is. So we have to have short, immediate payoffs to you. We did great. We saved $500. Yes, you can spend $100 to eat and then we'll keep saving. 
Because if you don't, one day I come, I get very nice things. That was not the goal. That was not the purpose. A goal is not a process. It's not a strategy. It's not a support. It's not a service. So when you're developing personal goals, <coughs> they should not be a need and they should not be a service. So the goal is not to get X, Y, Z. The goal is to get to this place. Now what do I need? I need personal attendant care services. I need behavioral health services. Those are the intermediate steps to get to the end of that, but a personal goal needs to be important to that person and it needs to have a definite end. It needs to have a time, it needs to have a place, it needs to have something that when you get to it, you can say, I did this. Who likes lists? Who likes to, to see? So I'm a highlight person, I like the colors. Some people like to strike through the list. Some people like to check the list, but there's something you get after just going, I went to the grocery store. I bought nothing I was supposed to, but I went to the grocery, because I don't even put it in the grocery store. If I put buy lettuce, I will never accomplish my goal. Did I get to the store? Yes. It makes you feel better. Immediately, what do you feel after you accomplish a goal? You feel like you can take on the next goal. Have you seen that commercial? Um, I don't remember what kind of commercial it is. He accomplishes something, and now he decides he can take on fitted sheets. Oh, come on, someone else knows. The Lowe's commercial. What happens in the Lowe's commercial? I can't remember what he accomplishes, but he is so excited. He goes, you know what? I think I can do anything. I'm going to take on fitted sheets. And about two seconds of the fighting with the fitted sheet, he's like, never mind. This is impossible. But it's the moment you do something, it's like jumping out of a plane. They say when you do it, I have not done this. I'm not crazy. My sister is. But if you, once you jump out of a plane, the euphoria from hitting the ground, you want to get up and do it again. You're more likely to jump out of a plane immediately after jumping out of a plane because that moment that you feel amazing and great, I want to do it again. It's the same thing in sales. You make a sale, the first thing they tell you to do, make another one. Why? You're already, at, nobody can tell you no. You won. You're on top of the world. Doesn't matter if they tell you no. Someone's going to tell you yes. You've had about 200 no's and you're like, I'm never selling anything again. I give up. I quit. All right. Before we go into the person-centered process, let's take a scenario. You have an individual who is, we're going to use 47. So they're 47 years old. They have had a history of going in and out of um, adult mental health facilities. They have multiple diagnoses, mental health, physical health, and um, other limitations. This individual, you're developing a person-centered plan. I want those individuals who typically do IDD plans to help us think about physical uh, disability and frail elderly because that's going to be different and new for them. You have an individual who, no matter what you do and no matter what you say, as soon as you tell them you're going to help them take their medication, they say yes. And as soon as you walk out the door, they say no. And you know that they don't take the medication. We end up back in a spiral and a cycle. And guess where we end up? And then when it's time to come home, we don't find, we have no housing. Everyone have the challenge of housing. We have no place to live because you disrupted the last place you live. And they have some struggles with their family. So mom is always willing to take them in. Mom probably should not be taking them in. They've got an unhealthy codependent relationship. Brother wants nothing to do with it. Don't call him. If he's in the hospital, I don't want to know because he stole from me. I've lost everything. Every time the person comes home, I can't do it. You've got a sister who will be willing to do anything, but they fight like cats and dogs. He just can't get a good relationship with his sister, but she'll always be there every time you call her. She will show up, pick him up from the hospital, help him find a place to live, but there's a struggle with her to help support. So thinking about how would you find out what's important to that person to trigger what they need? Okay, we'll start with the conversation. All right, I need a place to live. I need to take my medications. I need a better relationship with everybody in general because when I'm not taking my medications, I kind of screw up every relationship I have. When I am taking my medications, I, you know, I've got great relationships but I don't want to take my medications. So I've given you what they need. How do we get to what's important? What is it about your medications that you don't like? It makes me feel groggy. I don't like the way I feel. I feel like I, 
I just sleep all day. I don't get to do anything I like to do. I just don't enjoy it. I don't like the way I feel. So we're about a different type of medication, different doses. Okay. So what it, get me back to what's important. I'm given taking the medicine. Okay. What's important? How do I feel? I want to feel like I can operate the way I used to operate before I got sick. When I used to be able to go to work and I had a relationship, but now I take my medication and life is bad. I don't take my medication and life is bad. What's important to me? Okay, we picked up on work is important. What else is important to me? Feeling productive, feeling like I had a better life. And now my life is just meh. What else? I compared it to being sick. Okay. I had a good life before I got sick. So I think it's really sick. Maybe there's more one on the first one. Okay. So there's there's that there's something that's important to me is the way it was. What's important to me is getting back to the way it was. Alright. Likelihood of getting back to the way it was. Yeah, I would not say zip necessarily, but it probably will not be quite like it was before. So what's important to me is getting my relationships back, being able to work, feeling normal, whatever normal means, but feeling like I'm productive, but I've got lots of limitations. I've got mental health, I've got some physical health, I've got housing issues, I've got relationship issues. What's important for me? Keep going. Think of goals. What's important for me? I want some pretty thing, pretty big things that are not easy to put into a goal. I want a relationship. All right, I want a relationship. How do we put I want a relationship in a goal? Let's try, I want to get married. <laughs> Ask a couple of girls under the age of 30 who want to get married. That's a great goal, but it's not really something you can, you know, just put a plan and say, my husband will go to come to me in one year and five days, and he's going to look like this, and thank you, Jesus. You know, that's, it's, no, it's not that easy. But you can put steps in place okay. to, to be in those environments that are appropriate or to help encourage them to have so many more outings that were, are based on their preferences. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's, there's steps. So how would you get there? How would you get to what's important to me? Well, if you're important to you to get married, then, you know, several steps involved in outings. There's going to be people you to surround yourself with to meet, maybe meet somebody. Okay, so let's take this, uh, Kevin, to a goal. How do we make that personal? What's That's the easy piece. Place to go? Okay. Kind of personal to me is I want to meet somebody. All right, I want to, I want to bid back in relationships. I, I miss that part of life. So the question is, where do you like to go? What do you already like to do? What kind of people do you want to be in a relationship with? Okay. Do you want to go to church? Do you like people at church? Do you want to, do you just want to meet some people to be friends? Do you want to start there? So how do we turn that into a goal? How do we turn that into a measurable one year goal? Something that we can check on every few months and say, are we getting to where you need to be? So personal to me is what I want, but how do we get it to a goal? Okay, so the goal, we came up with a personal goal. Personal goal is, I want to meet someone. We have a conversation about, that's a good life goal. My life goal is to be in a, a long-term healthy relationship. This year, I'm probably not going to get married. This year, I may not even meet somebody that I would even want to talk to. However, the goal that we can talk about is you want to get back in relationships. That's important. I think someone here kind of brought up the, let's get to the underlying piece of that. I want to get into relationships. I like going to church. I like meeting people at church. I've always been in church. Okay. Well, you want to meet someone, you've got to get around some people. How about going to a Sunday service and a Wednesday service? Now you get to the next pieces of that, and that's what do you need to do to do that, right? That's when you get to services, supports. What can be done informally? What can be, needs to be paid? What happens to make those needs? But you see how we took what was personal and turned it into a goal. One year we can focus on, 
you know, the goal is to be able to go to at least four social events a month. Because I've identified, I've been going to two, and I want to get out to more. And then we can start looking at what's the barrier. I don't have transportation. I don't know anyone's number at church, so nobody can come and pick me up. Every time I go to that group, I don't like those people. That's not my kind of church people. I want different church people. So there may be more that, go, that goes on with that. So in the person-centered process, this is how we get to the plan piece. So we've assessed, we've identified, what do you want, what does it look like, and we're developing the plan. For the person-centered process, on IDD, we've always had a person-centered support plan. So you know you're getting to the plan. The other waivers have different names for it. For TBI, it's your progress plan, and it has progress goals. But ultimately, it's the process that CMS is looking at. It's not just the written documentation that you've developed this goal, you've developed the plan. It's the whole process of developing the integrated service plan that is built on the assessments and on the individual's personal needs. So the goals and preferences have to be noted and included. CMS wants to make sure that it's not just, my goal is one day to get married. That's wonderful. My preference is to be married before I'm 30. Well, that's wonderful. However, that's not a goal. So getting those preferences in there is important, but it needs to also have a goal that's with it. It needs to be timely. So essentially, CMS wants to see that plan, like we do with everything else, at least once every 365 days, to make sure that we're not just saying we set a goal and no one's ever looked at it again. No one's ensured the person got supports. No one's ensured that they even had anything to help them with their barriers. So the integrated service plan is developed based on all of the sources, your assessments, the person-centered plan, interviewing with the individual, their family members, all of the information because what I want, what I need, what's good for me, what's important to me, all of those can be competing information. So that's why we have teams of individuals who get together and say, okay, the plan is the document. The plan is the thing I should be able to give to anybody in this room and they know what I'm working on, what I need help with, where I need support, what's important to me, where I want to go in the long run. Ultimately, that plan should be very specific to this year and what I need. One of the limitations that I've seen in some of the plans that we've had in the past is they're very descriptive of when the person was five, but they're 55. And it tells me all about when they were born, and it tells me all about how they became uh, disabled, and it tells me all about their life experiences. And I haven't figured out, at 55, do you want to live where you're living? Do you want to change what you're doing? Do you want to go somewhere else? So the, the plan itself had a lot of information. It was 75 pages long. If you took that to a new provider, and you say, you need to follow this person-centered plan to meet this person's needs, and it tells me how beautiful the person's hair is, it tells me you know, the last time they went to an outing three years ago and they were very surprised they did well in the outing, is that a plan? If you saw that and you got that, is that your yeah, um, consumer you're working with? Would you need to rewrite it? Thank you. I, I was hoping I didn't have to say it. Can you repeat yourself? Staff wouldn't even read it. So how do you follow a plan when the first thing you do is go, yeah, it has a lot of, it, it's technically the plan, it technically has a date on it, but when you go to look at it, it doesn't tell you anything about the person. It tells you about their history, which can be helpful. Do you want to know kind of some history of the individual so that you can support them? Yes. But the purpose of that person-centered support plan, the person-centered plan is, how do I get the services that we need? These are your planning steps. We're not gonna walk through the planning steps because we wanna go through a couple of more scenarios. The key to the person-centered process is that it needs to be as much as possible from their point of view. Some of you have seen the shorter plans that they use in Oregon, four pages long, picture of the individual, picture of their circle of supports and needs, identifies what it is. The whole purpose is, can they read it? CMS wants to know that it is at a fifth grade le reading level. So if the entire plan is every one of their medications, that is not helpful. Because the individual is not going to go, yes, can you please give me these medications? It needs to be at their level. And as much as possible, if an individual can read, that they could read it. And someone who had limited English proficiency would be able to follow along and would be able to read it. We're at time now, so you might have five minutes. No stretch. problem. Okay. So let's talk about John. John wants to be a fireman. Why does John want to be a fireman? 
Likes helping people. Why else would John might want to be a fireman? Dad was a fireman. Okay, what else might be a reason why John wants to be a fireman? He likes fires? Is that <laughs> well, some people may have been thinking that. Someone actually said it out loud that he may want to be a fireman because he likes fires and sets fires intentionally. But here's the key. May fight, start fires intentionally to see the fireman. Not when you think of pyromaniac who just wants to just go and burn things down, they don't care. But someone, it's a, I love seeing the fireman. And every time I start a fire, guess what? Firemen show up at my house. I mean, it's a, it's a classic response of, here's what I want. I did this thing, and every time I do it, I get what I want. And what I want is to see the firemen. So if we find out, if we realize they're setting fires to see the firemen, they want to sit in the truck, they want to hang out with the firemen, they want to talk with, play with the fire dogs, they just love it. They, then how about we shift what we're focusing on so that they go see the firemen without starting a fire? Here's the problem John has. John's diabetic overweight, doesn't want to exercise, uh, probably needs to visit the dentist, has multiple teeth issues, uh, partially related to diabetes, partially related to having struggles with the dentist, lives in a rural area, so it's not like a lot of providers that are going to just say, hey, let's go to, the fire, go to the fire station. And then there's some behavior problems, starts fires, needs frequent redirection to prevent um, accidentally starting a fire, and then often wants to leave day supports angry because you didn't give him the candy you wanted. How are we going to support John? We're going to use this as our last example. How are we going to support John? What is important to John? Fires. <laughs> he wants to be a fireman. <laughs> Fires are only to get the fireman there. Okay, so be, being a fireman is important. Why would he have a barrier to being a fireman? His lifestyle does not match the lifestyle that you would expect of a fireman. How can we use what he wants to help him get to where he wants to go. Some examples. What you could develop in the visit the firehouse. I can do a fireman like lifestyle workout or something like that. Okay. This is what the firemen do. Work out with the firemen. Say, hey, you know, he wants to learn how to be a fireman. Show him what things that you as a fireman do. And that might be his plan. The plan is for the next three months, we're gonna visit the firehouse, learn with the firemen's exercise routine because you have to be strong to be a fireman instead of saying you have to lose weight right come on all of us have heard that you need to lose weight you're like yeah thank you <laughs> I needed to hear that but if you have a motivator okay I have to be strong to be a fireman that's very different than I need to lose weight to be a fireman so now I want to be strong okay what do they do to be strong well they have to lift weights well I can't lift any weights well we start with right and that gives them something to focus on give opportunities to volunteer Maybe the opportunity is just to wear the uniform. That for the hour that they wear the uniform, they start to, okay, I feel proud. I like being able to pick up all the stuff. So looking at the things that can be help in a year, six months to a year, that's the base of your goal. Looking at what's personal to him, and then what can you use to take the fire starting and turn it into volunteering, activities, things for that individual to do. I have a couple other things I want to introduce you to my brother, for those of you who have met Isaiah. It's Isaiah at our family reunion. Um, the rest of the slides that you'll have here, those are just additional things that are included in the plan. What I want you guys to know, and so that you know moving forward, here's what's going to happen. Over the next three months or so, we're going to be looking at the person-centered planning process across all of the waivers and developing a standard process. And one of the things that we're going to do is have our um, Provider calls that are on the first and the third Tuesday of every month. They're held from 10 to 11. We're going to start having provider information calls and talking about what not only what needs to go in the plan, because this is the rule, but what does it look like? How can we have some standardized plans across all of the waivers that it doesn't matter where I go. If I hand this plan to James and it's a 59-year-old, or I handed it over there to Candace, and it's a five-year-old that the plan tells me who the person is, what's important to them, what's important for them, what they're strong, what they're capable of doing, what their barriers and limitations are, and how they, what support they need to get to their ultimate goals. So what I would love for you guys to do is, I'm going to post these online, you can look at them, but start thinking about, all right, some of you have seen all kinds of plans, some really great ones that you're like, why can't everybody do this? And some that you're like, I'm just going to ignore that 
because I can't read it. It doesn't tell me anything. It's not written in any way that anybody will know what to do. The second piece to person-centered planning that CMS wants us to focus on is can the individual as much as possible do it themselves? Can the family as much as possible do it themselves? Because a true person-centered plan, you write in your diary for you. You make your goal plans for you. And as much as we can start putting that in their hands to be in control of that, gathering the information, developing that, I am more likely to do the thing that I created, that I wrote down, my goal that I wrote, is way better than the one my husband makes for me. So I appreciate you guys coming to our session today.